Okay guys, welcome back to class. Sorry I can't be there, but I hope this works out just as well. Um, so today we're going to do a ton of case studies and we're going to focus mostly on watching some videos, assessing some situations, looking at the body language that we talked about last week, and um, I'd like you to do a small write-up for each video that we show. Uh, Kate is going to give you about 15 minutes each to be able to, each video to be able to sit down, kind of think about the situation, what could have been safer, what the human could have done. I'd like you to send me your uh, write-ups for each and every video, and then we're going to go ahead next week and we're going to go ahead and review all of these videos. We're also going to talk about your homework at the end of this video. Um, for Thursday, uh, just a nice reminder, I'm going to need you to have a video of you handling and restraining a dog, a recorded video of you handling and restraining a dog sent to me and so we can discuss more on week three. But we'll talk about that at the end of this video. So let's go ahead and get started. So you guys know me, I am all about self-care in the dog world. So for the first 15 minutes today, we're gonna go ahead and um, we're going to write in our journals uh, a new wellness technique. So, well, not wellness technique, but you guys know what I mean. It's we're going to, this week's journal entry is what is something you will choose to do with your own dog this week? So a ton of times in the dog industry, we tend to obsess over other people's dogs. We will do anything for them and for our clients. We tend to overbook ourselves. We tend to um, cater to other people's dogs and sometimes ours get left behind. They are left for hours and hours alone. Sometimes we have 12 hour days. Um, but I want you to really focus in on your dog this week. What is something special that you can do between with you and your dog this week that you can journal about? So we're first gonna go ahead and start our new journal entry of what we're going to do um, what's something that you're going to do with your dog this week. And I also want to take the time, and Kate will host the discussion, of what you guys did last week for your wellness. Um, how it was accomplished, if it wasn't accomplished, how you could better try it, um, and how you could try it better in the future. Um, but really just taking that time to just check out from dog life, from your dog business, from your dog training stuff, and to really focus on you and your own dog. Um, the other thing I want you to really think about this week is I want you to take a time away when you are with your dog. I don't really want you to document it. Uh, a lot of the times when we go out with our dogs, especially if we haven't in a while, we tend to document everything. We take pictures for social media, look what I did with me and my dog this week, um, aren't I so interactive with my dog? But I want you to be present with your dog this week. So no social media, try to leave your phone at home if you can, if you're going even for a walk. Um, and I just don't really want you to think about your job. I just want you to be present with you and your own dog. Your dog loves you through thick and thin, through 12 hour days and through four hour days. And I want you to be able to be present with them and kind of just see how that feels. Just kind of body scan, see how you're feeling with it. And um, uh, like I said, just kind of journaling for the next 15 minutes. Then we're gonna take the additional 15 minutes to talk about last week's wellness. And um, then we'll go ahead and start with class. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So what are some of the things, um, when assessing a situation for safety, um, we want to think of the basic stuff. So the first thing we want to think about is evaluate the situation. Really look around and see what's going on. If you're about to have a private training session, what do you have on the floor? Is there a pair of scissors that a dog could get into? Um, is the client's purse on the ground that maybe the dog could get into? Something, just really evaluate and see every situation or everything in that situation that could be deemed as unsafe, okay? Investigate that situation. So, okay, you've got the client's purse on the floor. Let's go ahead and ask the client to go ahead and maybe move that to a higher level, um, just in case there's medication or anything like that in there. Um, minor things that have been left on the floor. It, like I said, is there office equipment anywhere around? Is there sharp edges that a puppy could bump into or start chewing? Um, just really investigating and really looking at nitty gritty little things that could add to a situation that could deem it as unsafe. The biggest thing I want you to think about as well is if you are meeting a client for the first time um, and like we talked about 
you are uh, maybe sent out that preliminary paperwork that talks about you know what makes your dog nervous um, basically what we talked about last week say you've sent that out um, really decide say you come back you're a brand new trainer the client comes back and says the dog has bitten multiple people shows extreme sign of fear when in new situations and um, has lunged at strange people I really want you to think in this situation are you qualified do you feel confident that you can handle this situation? When I first started out dog training, I really had to think about that. I kind of wanted to, you know, as young trainers, we kind of have to puff our chests out and say, oh, we can handle this, we can take on these situations, you know, trying to prove ourselves almost in the dog world. Not the safest choice on your part or anybody's part, really. So there's been plenty of times I have had clients where I feel I have only gotten them to a certain point and I, I'm not qualified anymore. I need additional help. Um, that is a stronger attribute from you than just taking on the client and being nervous or putting the client and the client's dog in an unsafe situation and inevitably yourself as well. So um, really think as well, do you have the training space for this particular client? If you have a client that is aggressive, that has bitten people, that has lunged, that is nervous in strange places, is your tiny training space going to be adequate enough? Do you feel safe going to the home? Um, there's really things that you need to evaluate, investigate, and decide if you are qualified for. That leads me to the next point. Pick the right environment. There has been so many times I have a little tiny training space that I kind of talked about before in Southeast that's basically not even one-third the size of this room and uh, I, there has been multiple times clients have come in and have just been too nervous. The space has been too small, it's too quiet, there's construction sounds going around, um, and they, I've gotten, I've seen plenty of hiding behaviors, um, teeth at, bared at me, um, and so you can certainly try, okay, maybe try some music on, close all the windows, things like that, but inevitably if the space is too small, and there's too much going on, that's not the right environment. You are creating an unsafe environment for that dog and that situation. And not only are you then and having the dog take steps back in its training, but you're really not even taking steps forward if you can't pick the right environment. That's going to be continuous throughout the first time you meet a client or the last time you see a client. You always want to make sure you're picking the right environment and making sure that the dog feels safe and comfortable. Even if you're having to work on triggers or things like that, you still want the environment to be molded that so that the dog feels safe and the client as well. So before anything, come up with a plan before you meet a new client. All of you guys are entering this school. This is your first class. Um, and you're just kind of, you know, I'm going to put you all in the same category as baby trainers, even if you aren't. Um, so before anything, you need to come up with a professional in coming up with a plan. Have some ground paperwork that everybody fills out before they even come out, asking some really heavy questions. You know, what are some things that make your dogs comfortable? What are some things that make your dogs uncomfortable? What are some signs that you have noticed of your dog is um, nervous or fearful. In this class you're going to notice, body, we're going to talk about body language, we're going to talk about the bite scale and everything like that, but you want to have a baseline knowledge of what the owners have noticed that their dog shows um, so that they, you not only observe yourself, with the, you observe the dog yourself, but you've also got a bit of the parents influence as well on what they, what they have observed and um, what they have gone through before. So come up with a plan. If the dog is uh, does better at home, seems less nervous, is uh, triggered by environmental cues, um, then maybe you want to consider meeting at home, meeting at the home first. That comes with a whole nother set of questions. Um, you you yourself want to feel comfortable before going to the home. Maybe you had a meetup at a park before. There's a lot of things that go into it, and each client is going to be different. I know my paper uh, my that I will be, uh, that Kate will be giving you all a set of my paperwork um, that I want you to go through and have. Every trainer is going to be different. I have about a small packet worth. Dr. Pockle um, with Animal Behavior, he has, I think, up to, you know, almost seven, eight pages of just multiple questions about your dog. Um, and so all we're trying to do there is really get to the point of what the dog's um, issues could be, uh, keeping the client safe, keeping the dog safe and also keeping ourselves safe as well. Throughout the entire time, if I could highlight anything really on here,
be appropriate is the biggest one I could say, is that if you are seeing signs of fear like we talked about last week, don't just go up to the dog and try and push it. You are a professional, a prof you're here to be a professional dog trainer, you're not the average I love dogs kind of person. So we're here to teach you how to approach a dog if it's nervous, how to go about um, maybe opening the dog up or, or getting the dog more comfortable without just getting right in his face, patting on the head, good doggy, forcing the situation. There's been, I would say, more consultations than not. I'm not even giving the dog any attention. I'm, I'm a nothing in the room to the dog. I more so want the dog to sit around, be comfortable, um, you know, sniff out the facility. Maybe I'll leave some puzzle toys, which we'll learn more in, a, in your future classes. But, um, you know, half the time I'm really not even engaging. If the dog wants to engage with me, I will engage back, but it's really not something I'm going to force upon the dog. So really, be appropriate, even on the streets, even if you're not uh, planning to have your own dog training facility, or um, if you're working in a shelter, or if you're um, working with uh, service dogs, especially service dogs, be appropriate. Don't just um, go off of that dogs love you. You know, not every dog will, even if you are, you know, becoming a dog trainer. So. Just cautiously assess the situation. If you're starting to see nervous body language, if you're starting to see the dog retract, if you're starting to see everything that we discussed last class, be cautious. Maybe you need to cut a lesson 20 minutes short because the dog is starting to fall apart. Maybe you need to cut the consultation short because the dog is starting to be uncomfortable with your presence. Maybe you need to do a, a phone call first. Um, there's so many things that go into it that you need to start being able to puzzle piece together that will eventually help you. Um, it'll get easier over time. At first with me, it was difficult to think of every little thing in the room that the dog could be nervous of. For instance, um, I'll show you a picture in one of the slides. My training space is small, but it has a bunch of shelving and a bunch of um, training equipment on it. And on the very top shelf, I have multiple stuffed dogs. Well, a ton of times I have to close the curtain to my training space, which blocks almost kind of like the Wizard of Oz. It blocks out all of those things because that's something that could make a dog nervous and could basically take the dog 10 steps back, especially if it's a reactive dog. So I really want to make sure that I'm noticing things the average person wouldn't notice. Maybe it's a light reflection for herding dogs. Maybe it's a sound of construction that they might be nothing to you, but it's huge to the dog. So little, I mean, any environmental cue could stress a dog out, and we have to almost become, I will never master how much dogs have mastered our body language to them, but we need to get pretty darn close as dog professionals um, out here. So always, 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 after you've gone through all of these steps, you feel comfortable with how you're going to meet the client, you feel comfortable, you've gotten your room prepared, you've designed a nice training environment for the dog, um, you've, uh, you're assessing the situation, you're seeing what could go wrong. Once the dog is there, you're assessing more. Now you need, to, once you're in the situation, you need to have an emergency plan. What is gonna happen if that, what happens if that dog finds something and reacts towards you? What happens if the dog is just, walks in the room and just falls apart um, emotionally? What, you know, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna cut the session short? How are you going to word that to the client so they don't feel that they're getting their money gypped? Hey, last but not least, one of the most important things is how to break, know how to break up a dog fight. I just want to go around, share our experience, um, and just kind of talk about how you went about it. I will, after the, this discussion, we'll go over a previous student at one of their experiences from last year. I think it's one of the best examples of how you can do everything right and still emotionally take a huge toll. So um, let's go ahead and take a pause. We'll go ahead and talk about it. I'd like, if, if you'd like to go ahead and share your experience with me, you can go ahead in your uh, write-up, share this part of the segment, and then we'll go ahead and um, uh, continue on. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a couple case studies of some of the clients that I've had over the past couple of years and kind of talk about the situation, um, the history of the dog, how I set up the training situation, how maybe um, I could have done it better. And then we're going to take about 15 minutes for each case study. You all have the email that I sent you with the 
Word documents asking some questions about each case study. I'd like you to be able to email me those back a couple of days after class. Um, I'd like them no later by Friday, and that would be July, I believe, 12th. <laughs> um, so uh, I will go ahead and put that in your homework, though. But um, let's go ahead and start with the first one. So Piper the German Shepherd is a client that I had about two years ago. Uh, Piper was a one-year-old German Shepherd. She lived a life with a military family that had multiple kids. Um, she basically just kind of lived in the garage. Um, so dad was military dad, mom was stay-at-home mom, and Piper was the cute puppy that they got for Christmas um, that they basically ended up just kind of keeping in the garage. Um, so I don't know if, I'm sure you know you guys have experiences with adolescent German Shepherds. Um, a lot of work goes into them. So um, Piper was very unsocialized. I mean, if you think about it, she only knew the same people for her first year of life. Um, you guys are going to go over in Kate's class the um, stages of those fearful periods. So really, Piper just lived in this in this garage for, for very essential points in her life. Um, really under socialized with sounds and, and basically life it, it itself. Um, you know, anything heavy sounding, and extra people, anything like that. And she became very protective of her family. Um, she had never lived with another dog before. Um, and after about a year, year and a half, the people uh, decided to, to get rid of her. So she was adopted by a younger couple who came to me. Um, they had had her for just a couple of weeks before they came to me. They lived in a smaller condo in, right in the middle of Northeast Portland. So pretty heavy traffic. And Piper was extremely reactive to everything, to city sounds, to people, to dogs, to um, anything that was out of the realm of her comfort zone, which was pretty much everything. So when they first came to me, I had the, I sent the paperwork first. Uh, I had a phone consultation. We started off with email. I got an idea of what Piper was like. Then we had a phone consultation. Hearing a little bit about the situation, I thought, okay, maybe we shouldn't meet at first right off the bat let's go ahead and talk about who I am as a trainer what I can provide for them and it, and I always ask the client first um, when doing consultations if I seem like the right fit for them I always say to clients picking a dog trainer is like picking a doctor um, and it's vulnerable you half of my clients come to me crying um, because they feel they have lost hope they, they don't believe in their dog anymore some of them feel like they don't even know if they want to keep the dog anymore so you really want to make sure the client feels comfortable with you before you go ahead and start any type of training plan with them so the first time that we talked on the phone Mom, uh, as much as I love her dearly, really underestimated how reactive Piper was. So I got the impression, let's just go ahead and get started at uh, training right in my training space. Let's get her out of the home, the place that she protects so much, and maybe let's try a smaller place. Well, the first time I met Piper, the second I went to go turn around, um, which was pretty quickly, I got up after we were talking, I went to go turn around and get Piper a treat, and Piper bit me right on the butt. So um, that's, one, that's the first interaction I first had with Piper. I wore a baseball hat um, when I first met Piper. I had a hooded vest on when I first met Piper. Um, she, we, it took multiple sessions of either going back from her home to the training space um, and and this was a dog that I ended up uh, giving uh, asking to bring additional help with I felt I had you know I started I started off on t uh, multiple wrong feet and we'll go ahead and have you kind of write off uh, write up what multiple wrong feet I did <laughs> wrong there um, but I started off on you know on the wrong foot and and Piper just we, we couldn't really get much further we did a ton of um, engage disengage we had to do a ton of work with her just getting comfortable with me um, when I first went to the home there was a lot of stalking going on so I really want you guys to think about these three questions with Piper what would you change about our training setting where, where would you maybe host it where how what would you have done differently um, what would you, even in that first maybe phone con um, consultation, what would you have asked maybe more that I didn't ask? Um, where would you have started the training? Uh, would you have gone to the home first? Why? 
would you have gone to the training space? Why? Um, and what part of our history helped you come up with some of these things? Um, now, please know in your write-up, there really isn't a right or wrong answer. I am just sharing uh, my experiences and, and, and looking for you to just see how I could have changed all these things because you guys are going to go through the same exact things. You're going to have, you're not going to be perfect right off the bat. You're going to have clients that years later, because Piper, this, this case was about, is about two years old, um, you're going to say years later, like, Aaron, like, what, what were you thinking? You know, what, what would, why did you go about that way? Or, and you learn from these things. So I'd like to get your opinion um, and to see what you would have done and how you would have handled it. And um, so let's take about the next uh, 15 minutes or so, and let's go ahead and write about Piper. Okay, guys, thanks for putting up with the technical difficulties. Let's keep going. So. Kelly Terrier Mix. Kelly uh, came to me about two years ago. She is still currently a client of mine, um, but her uh, case study is pretty interesting. So, Kelly uh, was adopted at a very young age. She, I believe she's about three now. When they first adopted Kelly, they got her from the local shelter in California, um, and they lived in a big house with a back fenced backyard and didn't really notice any of the problems that they're noticing now. Um, about two years ago, they moved up to Portland and moved into an apartment in a very busy part of, um, I believe it's Southeast Portland. So uh, I've never been to the apartment. So Callie became very reactive, nervous, um, very easy to, uh, just high anxiety. She became reactive to people, to sounds, to dogs, to um, pretty much anything and everything, any environmental cue that she found threatening, especially in the apartment. So when Portia, her mom, came to me, um, I had her fill out my new client consultation paperwork, and I thought to myself, okay, the red zone is the apartment, let's go ahead and get Callie out of the apartment, and let's go ahead and have her come to the training space, and let's see what we can uh, do there. As soon as she came in for her in-person consultation at the training space, Callie immediately hid under the chair. She immediately uh, bared her teeth, did some lip curling. I think she went after my ankles a couple of times and just completely, really honestly, just shut down during the consultation. Um, so she did, uh, like I said, she did go after my ankles a couple of times um, and to get the full understanding of Callie, I kept the consultation going um, for the full hour that I give clients. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm going to show you a training session here that I have with Callie. And in your write-up, I would like you to uh, evaluate maybe why I would take this route, um, what exactly I'm working on, what stage of the training do you think this might be in, and why did I try to account for safety in the method that I'm doing this. So let's go ahead on, in your PowerPoint in the Cali slide, let's go ahead and uh, watch our Cali training session.